Excelsior, true believers! You are about to embark upon a journey, a trip to the 70s and 80s, when mighty Marvel Comics ruled over all. The Defenders, Doctor Strange, the Champions, Deathlock, the Submariner, the Incredible Hulk, Kill Raven, the Son of Satan, the Macabre Man Thing, and all your other Bronze Age favorites every week appearing on Defenders Dialogue. Now, here are your guides, Christopher Golden and Brian Keane. Oh, that was nice. Let's capture that yawn. Uh, Matt, I want you to isolate that yawn and keep it. I don't, I don't know if it started recording in time to capture that <laughs> yawn. That was a yawn. You know, whenever I yawn like that, I think of uh, of a TV series that started as a movie, Brian, that I know you must be familiar with from our collective youth, The Life and Times of Grizzly Adams. Oh, I love Grizzly Adams. Grizzly Adams was fantastic. I, I didn't take it to heart, obviously, as much as you, because you've become Grizzly Adams. <laughs> um, but uh, but that movie and show uh, is dear and dear to my heart. And the bear in the show, Ben. Yep. Uh, every time I do a big yawn like that, I think of Ben because he would always make that. You know, that. If, if I ever get another dog, I'm actually naming it Ben. Uh, true story. So yeah. I, I have after the bear from Grizzly Adams. Yep, exactly. I always wanted to name a dog Ben, and I always wanted to name a dog Snake after Snake Plissken. And uh, unfortunately, every time I've owned a dog, I've been in a relationship, and the significant other has has vetoed both of those. Uh, <laughs> same thing happens when I try to name my my kids. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, yeah, but that's because uh, what woman wants to name her child Grizzly Adams Keen? I think it's a fine name. <laughs> anyway, hello, listeners. No, you have not tuned into the the Grizzly Adams fan cast. Uh, it's Defenders Dialogue. Although, Chris, give us a hearty Excelsior. Excelsior, true believers. That's right. And, Excelsior, and, indeed. You know, hello to the other one Grizzly Adams fan who might be listening to this. Listen. The Life of Times of Grizzly Adams was yet another formative piece of my youth. It goes hand in hand with the uh, uh, Bronze Age Marvel comics that we talk about every week. Absolutely. Absolutely. With Matt and Jack. Come I'm on, sorry. Matt go ahead. Jack from that show. You cut out on me there, dude. What did you say? I said like Mad Jack from Grizzly yeah. Adams. It's the old yeah. prospector character. You know, the old, or old mountain man character, you know. That's a great show. I wonder if it's streaming anywhere because I would you watch. Know, I was I was thinking that as you were as you were talking about Mad Jack, I was like, God, I haven't seen Grizzly Adams since I was a kid. I wonder if it's streaming anywhere. Yeah. I'm not going to do it on this show, but I could sing you the theme song to Grizzly Adams right now. I think you should. I'm not going to. No, no, I no. think I think for any listener of Defenders Dialogue who attends the the annual Merrimack Valley Halloween Book Festival taking place in October this year. Uh, in uh, I can never pronounce the town's name correctly. Go ahead, Chris. Haverhill, Massachusetts. Haverhill, Massachusetts. No, no, no. Haverhill, <laughs> Haverhill, Massachusetts. I think they should come up to your table and request that you sing the Grizzly Adams theme they song. Can, they can request it. They won't get it. Um, maybe at next year's Nikon, late at night. Um okay. You know, but I think also that, uh, you know, you did suggest on Twitter this past week that a bunch of horror authors put together some kind of performance or an album. Um, and, and Josh Mallerman, the great writer, Josh Mallerman and, and uh, founding member of the High Strung said he's in. Well, Casey Lansdale said she's in. Let's let's clarify. I. uh I did not propose this. Joe Lansdale proposed this. Oh, okay. And, and Joe Lansdale proposed that I produce it because Joe knows I'm certainly not busy and I have time to do this. <laughs> uh, and Joe also knows he'd tell me, go jump off a bridge and I'll fucking do it. So, yeah. Um, but, I mean, he's right. And and you brought up Josh Malaman 
Casey Lansdale, uh, both recording artists, you know, long before they ever wrote. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, Ron Malfi, uh, yeah. who plays guitar for Veer. Uh, yeah. Nate Carson, drummer for one of my favorite metal bands, Witch Mountain. Uh, Jeremy Wagner from Broken Hope. Uh, there are a number of talented musicians who moonlight as as writers or writers who moonlight as as rock stars um joe's idea has a lot of merit um and yeah uh, the aforementioned jeremy wagner has a a recording studio that that we can use to to produce you know uh, to mix it uh of course you know the the musicians are scattered so they'd have to they'd have to well, record joe, them joe also suggested uh our friend amber benson yes uh, Amber definitely has a recording studio in her house. Her boyfriend, uh, Mike, is an uh, engineer and recording artist uh, who records and tours and produces Dispatch. Right. Band Dispatch. Um, so, uh, so, you know, there are all kinds of connections here, I think. All kinds of connections. And, uh-huh. you know, because Joe thrust this on me on Twitter, I then started actually thinking about it and taking some notes. And... We, we have enough talent to do a double album, particularly if we include musicians who are fans of ours, uh, such as Scott Ian of Anthrax, uh, Xander Harris, who, of, of course, did an entire concept album based on one of my books. Uh, you know, the guys from Church of Disgust, Sick of It All, uh, uh, the guy that you and Levin really enjoy, whose name Frank I... Frank Turner. Yeah, Frank Turner. Uh, uh, Rio yours. <laughs> well, I thought Rio could be a bonus track. <laughs> <laughs> Rio, okay, this is again like clearly this is a total like tangent off of all of this, but we promise uh, we're gonna get the comic books. <laughs> so so Rio, I was invited to be the the keynote speaker at uh the International Vampire Film and Arts Festival in Sigishwara, Transylvania, a few years ago. Uh, Sigishwara is the birthplace of, of Vlad Tepish, Vlad Dracula. Um, and uh, Rio and Tim also came over as guests um, to be in pa- on panels and stuff. So the three of us was a small event, probably the greatest moment of my professional career, because what a time we had. I, mean, I can't tell you how beautiful the the uh, the area of Transylvania is it's stunningly gorgeous. You can get a uh, you can get a full dinner with a beer and a, a, like an appetizer and uh, uh, an entree and dessert and coffee for like ten dollars. Wow, um, it's it's ridiculous. Um, so absolutely beautiful. I have I have so many memories of of that trip. But among them is that. On the final night we were there, there was live um, live music karaoke with these two guys. And forgive me, Rio, I can't remember uh, what bands the, the, the keyboard player played in, but he was a professional, you know, rock and roll uh, keyboard player. He was a keyboard player and a guitarist, and they knew literally every song you could name. Yeah. So um, Rio and I, I was very tired. I went to bed relatively early and Rio and Tim, of course, closed the place down as they do. Rio and I sang uh, easy by the Commodores. Uh, We sang Baker Street. (laughs) Wow. And then uh, uh, shortly thereafter, I went to bed. Uh, Tim told me later that uh, a couple of maybe three other people did songs. And after that, it was literally Rio Ewers singing every song drunk till two o'clock in the morning in his best <laughs> lounge lizard like standing on the bar like laying his body over uh the patrons while he sang to them um uh so so you could picture all of that uh when you talk about our bonus real yours track um well, now he's actually got a good now. he's got a good voice and he plays guitar now too. he does and, and we tease rio but uh, the fact of the matter is in another life he could have been a professional musician and been very successful at it um mm-hmm. he, he's a great guitarist and and yeah he can carry a tune um so. yeah well and he's got that baby face that doesn't hurt you know who else has a baby face peter parker i he knew you were going Spider-Man. there <laughs> uh marvel team up issue number nine spider-man and iron man 
uh, in the Tomorrow War. Yeah, so it's not Good the goodbye. Tomorrow War. That's, it's not the Tomorrow War that's playing on uh, Amazon Prime right now. Well, it's it's scripted by Jerry Conway with art by Ross Andrew, inks by Frank Bowl. The interesting thing about this, Brian, is reading the first few pages. Well, and and once we get to what it's about, it is the movie that's on Amazon right now, starring Chris Pratt, that everyone says is really really bad. Um, but I'm going to watch it anyway. But uh, I. I enjoyed it. I mean, it's it's not a smart film at all. There are plot holes big enough to that Galactus could walk through, uh, but it's fun. If you enjoyed Independence Day, you enjoy this film. It, okay. it, it, you know, it's it's a it's a big fun loud movie. Well, basically, what's happening is that uh, we're in Manhattan. Avengers Mansion is surrounded by some kind of force field. And there's a little bit of an earthquake going on around it. Something is happening. It's 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 going in and out of uh, of of reality. Um, Iron Man shows up. There's some uh, you know the the NYPD officer who is there on the scene does not like superheroes in any way. No. Uh, so when Iron Man shows up, he's like basically trolling Iron Man big time. Iron Man goes to try to see what's wrong, and he runs into the force field. Uh, we cut away to Peter Parker, who's who's seeing this on the news, uh, and realizes that uh, well, initially he's like, I, "I like this scene, Brian. I've got enough of my own troubles. Let the Avengers handle this crap, but the Fantastic <laughs> Four can go help him. I got too much going on." And then Peter Parker goes home uh, to his apartment that he shares with Harry Osborn. And Harry is a total dick of a roommate. Now, yeah. I've had, I've had bad. Brian, have you had bad roommates? I've had bad roommates, but th- this is the kind of roommate that w- I would have punched back in the day. Um, completely uncharacteristic for Harry Osborne's character. I have to wonder at what point in Marvel history this issue takes place. Maybe this is around the time Harry's starting to become the Green Goblin. I don't know. Um, yeah, but yeah, he's just he's a dick. Yeah, he's such a dick. He's just like flies off the handle. I had this Harry here in this issue is the roommate I had my freshman year in college uh, who who did five or six shots of vodka every night to just to go to sleep. Um, yeah, he was he was an interesting guy. Uh, we had a, I, I, I had a roommate like a bunk mate like that, a guy I served with. RM1 Gable, who I can talk about because I'm sure he's dead now. Um, he would drink like that, you know, yeah. on land. Uh, and when we got out to sea, and of course there was no alcohol available, he would stock up on NyQuil and Robitussin. Uh-huh. And he would drink bottles of it every night. Uh, well, per- perhaps, uh, perhaps not coincidentally, this freshman year roommate of whom I speak, Dan Wisielowski is also sadly departed from this play. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's it's a very it's a very. But he was a t- he was a nightmare roommate. It started off OK, but um, I could tell you stories. But anyway, Harry <laughs> Osborne is just like those two. Your bunk mate, my roommate. Uh, he he co- comes in screaming at Peter to turn the TV down because he's got the Peter has the news on. Uh, and then he, he yells at him and he slams the door. So basically, Peter is so annoyed. He's got nothing else to do, but he wants to leave the apartment. So he goes to help out Iron Man just because he's in a bad mood. Yep. Yep. So he shows up at Avengers Mansion and, uh, you know, Iron Man's like, I don't need your help, kid. Um, and, you know, Spider-Man gets all smart ass with him. Uh, and then they discover that there is a hole in this invisible force field. But when they jump through it, uh, what happens, Chris? Uh, they tumble through a, a sort of Steve Ditko-esque limbo realm uh, with all designs. And then they, they there, there are... Uh, quote-unquote space vessels worthy of Star Trek 
um, that are traveling through this weird limbo realm that fire on them and eventually take Iron Man captive. Um, and then they, uh, they're captured and they're brought before, you know, Brian, I, w- I hope you show this image because even though it is Zarko, the tomorrow man, uh, he looks suspiciously like Mike Myers as Dr. Evil in the Austin Powers films. Very much so. Very much uh, so. Uh, yeah. Now, I have to I have to admit, I'm 53 years old. I've been reading Marvel comics since I was six or seven. I have never seen Zarko the Tomorrow Man until now. Uh, the, the editorial caption tells us we last saw him in Thor 102, but I was not a Thor reader as a kid. Uh, so this is all new to me. Yeah, no, it's new to me as well, although I'm pretty sure I've heard of Zarko. Yeah. Um, but here's where we get into the, uh, the, the space where it seems to me like the makers of the Tomorrow War were inspired by this issue of Marvel Team Up, um, because basically this is what's happened. Zarko says that he's from the 23rd century. And that uh, invaders from the future have come back to attack his people in the 23rd century. So he has gone to recruit uh, heroes from the past to come and save his people from that invasion. Um, And the thing is that the front cover of this issue references the Tomorrow War. Right. And this is, you know, so I'm not suggesting that the, the writer of the Tomorrow War uh, read this comic, but it's entirely possible. Entirely possible. Uh, anyway, you know, he takes them, as Chris said, to the 23rd century, uh, and there's a fortress from uh, an enemy, a, a mysterious invader who he has not named. Um, and in that fortress are the captive Avengers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, we have fight, fight, fight. They make their way into the fortress. Uh, you know, there are pages of this, uh, them trying to be clever. Um, and, you know, I, I do like this uh, sort of dick waving contest that Spider Man and Iron Man get into, um, where they're like, you know, is your webbing strong enough to hold this door in place? Why, yes, it is. You know, like, <laughs> um, I also found interesting here that. In 1974, which is, I think, around 73, 74, where this was coming out, Tony Stark is and, and, and Peter Parker are already supposed to be some of the smartest you know, guys on Earth. Right. And they're not very smart in this. Like, the idea, it seems like neither one of them is all that <laughs> familiar with science in this issue. Exactly. Um, and I, I know part of it is the writing of the day, but, you know, it, it becomes interesting to me later. But, yeah. One, so there's one very subtle touch. Yes. Conway did. And I, as as a writer and as a Tony Stark fan, I appreciated it. You know, if you remember the Tony Stark of this era, um, he does weapons development, you know, just like in the first MCU movie. Uh, that's that's how Stark International makes its money. And and. You know, there there is a, a line of dialogue between him and Spider-Man where he says, uh, you know, my interest is self-defense. Um, I like that. I thought that was in character for the Tony Stark of the 70s. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I also want to point out that when they when they do discover uh, the Avengers in suspended animation, uh, you know, that's why Avengers Mansion was what it was, that Zarko wanted to draw these other heroes here. Um, that lineup is a great lineup. It's it's um, the Vision and the Scarlet Witch, Black Panther, Quicksilver, Thor, Captain America. And I love the fact that while he was abducting the Avengers, Zarko also thought it was important to abduct Jarvis, their butler. Exactly. Uh, I've always said Jarvis is the heart of the Avengers in the comics. Although I, I, I must point out, it wasn't Zarko that abducted them. It was the mysterious figure in purple uh, who's seated behind a control panel. Now, before we get to that figure, 
Uh, spoiler warning, major spoiler warning for the season finale of Loki season one. Uh, we're about to spoil the big bad. So if you have not watched it, skip ahead about 10 minutes and we should be done talking about it oh, by then. Yes. At, at five minutes or 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Say. All right. Spoiler warning starting now. Yeah. Uh, it turns out this invader who kidnapped the Avengers and who Zarko is using Spider-Man and Iron Man to defeat is none other than he who remains Kang the Conqueror. Now, let's talk for a minute about Kang. I have much, people are going to yell at me, but much like Deadpool, I've never liked Kang until I saw him on screen. Uh, Agreed. Uh, I'm not going to yell at you. I, I, Kang has always been, to me, one of those super irritating villains because he's a villain that writers can kind of do whatever the hell they want with. And every appearance is kind of irritating. You know, he's not going to be defeated. You know, there, you know, there's some other, it's just too easy, too convenient. They come up with, uh, whatever additional story line that, you know, it's just like, I don't know. I just don't like Kang. It's not, um, anyway, Kang, the conqueror, is a time traveler uh, who is also known under a variety of other names, including Immortus. Um, And he's been a villain in various guises over the course of Marvel history. Uh, In this case, he has invaded the 23rd century. And according to Zarko, Kang's intention here is to use the 23rd century as a beachhead from which to attack 1973, which is That's where right. these Avengers have come from. Um, but now that Iron Man and Spider-Man are there to aid him, Zarko's hoping to defeat Kang and use Kang's technology to do the same thing Kang was intending, to take over the world of 1973. Now, why either one of these buffoons wants to do this, I have no idea. <laughs> do you have any idea about this brian i mean you know i i look back on 1973 i was a little kid so i look back on it with nostalgia however if i look at it through my parents eyes that must have been a nightmare to live through <laughs> you know vietnam was still going on civil unrest was equal to if not possibly greater than it is right now uh you know the economy was in the toilet yeah, I, I don't know why they'd want to take over 1973. I mean, you know, they're in the 23rd century. Presumably, uh, the 23rd century, as envisioned from 1973, um, I, I imagine was somehow improved. Um, I'd have to look, too, because I wonder if Zarko's time is the same time that uh, um, that Deathlock takes place in. I don't know. We'd have to, we'd have to look at that no, time. Death- Deathlock is a little before Zarko. Okay. And Killraven is after Zarko. And then, of course, the Guardians of the Galaxy are after Killraven. Right. Um, so, but yeah, I, I don't know. But uh, I, I agree with you on Kang. I've never enjoyed Kang in the comic books, um, not even in the original Secret Wars. And I love the original Secret Wars miniseries, but I just, Kang has never done it for me. But. I liked how they wrote him in Loki. I thought it was very smart. They they never call him Kang, you know, but they, they do reference that he's gone by all these names and all these aliases, one of which, of course, is the Conqueror. Right. Um, you know, and there's no doubt at the end when Loki sees the statue, it's it's Kang the Conqueror. Right. Um, and Jonathan so Majors, I, the actor playing Kang, Jonathan Majors, knocked it out of the park. He did. Yeah. yeah. So I'm I'm actually hopeful and eager to see what they what they do with him in in phase four of the MCU. I do not think he will be the big bad. Um, you know, as, as Thanos was, I I I, ha- I have a theory on who the big bad of phase four will end up being. Uh, I think it's either going to be Mephisto or Galactus. Um, but I, I think Kang will be a, a means to introduce that big bad. Well, again, the, the thing is that the way that they lay it out in Loki, the idea is that once the the 
what they call the sacred timeline unravels into trillions of potential parallel worlds, parallel realities. Every one of those realities has a Kang. And what the conqueror at the end of Loki establishes is that all of those Kangs started a multiversal war against one another for control of the, the multiverse. And he won. And so he unified them all into one you know, sacred timeline. Um, but the end of Loki is his destruction. And now we know from that that there will be an infinite number of Kangs. So to, in that regard... I suspect that he is, if not the big bad, one of the big, big bads, because there are so many of him. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so we'll see. And then uh, next episode, now we're going to go on to Marvel 2 and 1, but next episode we'll continue this story because it picks up in, in uh, issue 10 of Marvel Team Up, Spider-Man and the Human Torch. That's right. Um, but also Marvel the- 2 and 1, 9 uh, picks up Right where we left off a couple episodes ago, uh, you'll remember we thought that Puppet Master had died uh, in the ruins of the Mad Thinker's laboratory. Well, spoiler alert, right there on the cover of Marvel 2 and 1 9, uh, the Thing and Thor are pawns of the Puppet Master. And, and again, somehow weirdly, you know, I'm not sure how this happened because. Uh, so, firstly, that issue that you're talking about, our last appearance of the Puppet Master on this show and in Marvel continuity, uh, was in Marvel Team Up with right. Spider Man and the Thing. Now, we're Marvel 2 and 1, Thing and Thor. At the end of the previous issue of Marvel 2 and 1, the next issue box promised us the Thing and Iron Fist. Right. Now, uh, Steve Gerber plotted this issue, but then was off the book, and Chris Claremont scripted it. And Claremont will go on to script a number of issues after this. Um, now, I did some research, and I can tell you what happened, because you brought that up on last week's episode. Um, you know, everybody associates, of course, Chris Claremont with the X-Men. Mm-hmm. But there is another character that Claremont really shined with uh, and loved to write, and that was Iron Fist. Um, and... What I found out, according to some of the the Marvel bullpen old timers that I spoke to, uh, their thought was that Gerber had already plotted this issue, turned the plot in, got it approved. Uh, That would have been Len Wein at the time. He was the editor. Um, But at this point in Marvel history, as we know, Gerber was overwhelmed with deadlines. He he was writing like eight books a month. Um, So he was taken off of this and Claremont was brought in. But they still had to pay Gerber for the plot. So Claremont scripts this issue based on Gerber's plot. That way they both get paid. Um, and I guess he had pitched the Iron Man, or the, excuse me, the Iron Fist story, but then just never got around to writing it. Because, well, as as we see in the the issue following this, there's no Iron Fist either. Right. Interesting. So, um, well, in any case, the art is by Herb Trippi, inks by Joe Giella. Um and and again, the title of the story is When a God Goes Mad. Um, but we open with uh, what appears to be the Fantastic Four fighting Dr. Doom. But, Brian, that's not what it is. What What is it? It's a puppet show. <laughs> it's, a, it's a puppet show at a children's matinee. Uh, and our cast, of course, uh, you know, Ben Grimm. The ever loving blue eyed thing, name Arita, uh, the Submariner's cousin, uh, her best friend Anne, and of course my favorite, Wondar, the starborn superhuman with the mind of an infant, are all attending the show because you know they're there for Wondar. They're they're taking their kid to the the children's matinee. Yeah, and and, and Wondar persists in calling the thing Unc- Unca Benji like yep. Frank does. Um. As much as you love Wondar, that's as much as I hate him. I love Wondar. I love the idea of the powers of Superman with the mind of a toddler. I love it, too. I love that idea. But I hate him as a supporting character in this book. I hate the, like, you know, the whiny, like, 
ta- tagging along like, oh, my God, it's just annoying. Well, he grows um, out of that eventually. The other thing is that when the puppet show is over, the puppeteer comes out and takes a bow. Uh, he's dressed in his best Howdy Doody cowboy outfit. Um, it is very clearly the puppet master in a wig. <laughs> ben Grimm even says, that guy looks like the puppet master. But that's impossible. He's dead. The way the puppet master is drawn, it would be impossible to see this guy and not know it's the same guy. No two people look like this guy. <laughs> um, but then... The thing goes to try to follow him to investigate because he does look like the puppet master. And all the little kids who are at the matinee recognize the thing and they basically attack him and rip his clothes apart, trying to get autographs and get uh, a scrap of his clothing. Um, I love this scene. It reminds me of uh, I was talking. I was interviewing James Marsters from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And he was talking about how when he was a little bit younger and he played, uh, I think he played Jesus in Jesus Christ Superstar. Uh, He was mobbed and his his clothes were torn um, by young women who wanted uh, a piece of his clothing. I believe that story. That's the life right there. That's living your best life. (laughs) (laughs) But I do love when uh, he's being overwhelmed. And, and he's yelling, help, somebody help. <laughs> but yeah, they get away. They get back to the fantastic car. Uh, and, you know, Ben is just, he's in a foul mood now as they fly back to the Baxter building. And then his mood gets even worse uh, because they're almost broadsided by Thor. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, one thing that interests me is the Puppet Master has these abilities. He has this special radioactive clay If he forms an image of you in clay, uh, he can then control your mind. But in both his previous appearance and in this appearance, he's amplified that mutant power or whatever it is that he has uh, with some outside means. In this case, it's uh, radio or radion, the radioactive man who is using his power to amplify the puppet master's abilities Otherwise, the Puppet Master would not be able to control an Asgardian god, Thor. But he does. But he does. And he sends Thor, like a guided missile, to the Baxter building to attack the Fantastic Four. Now, let me ask you another question. This is weird. You know, occasionally we get into the... I mean, this is this whole show, as I've said before, is such a fanboy, like, ridiculous nonsense session. Um... And I'm going to make it worse now. Uh, I never liked the fact that during this period, Johnny Storm's Fantastic Four uniform is red. See, I always liked the red uniform. Uh, <laughs> I, my first issue of Fantastic Four was this era when when Johnny has the uh, the red costume, and uh, so that's what I always uniform think. Uniform means uniform. So they're supposed to match, Brian. But Johnny is a rebellious teenager. He's, he doesn't want to match his sister, his older sister, or her, her egghead boyfriend. <laughs> well, he, wants no. to, he wants to do his own I mean, thing. that makes sense, but still, it's supposed to match. In any case, uh, so the Fantastic Four fights Thor. Well, three of the Fantastic Four fight Thor. Um they are uh, he is hold, he's not holding back, but they are Susan Richards, the uh, the invisible woman is able to use a force field for quite a while to hold back Mjolnir, but uh, can't do it. And eventually she passes out. And when Thor sees them helpless, he snaps out of that control and he realizes that he's injured all three of them, Reed, Johnny, Sue and. What does he do at that point, Brian, that uh, of course he would do, but people who only know him from the MCU would be shocked by? Well, that's right. He turns back into his alter, his human alter ego of Dr. Donald Blake. And yeah, if you only know Thor from the MCU, you're like, who the hell is that? Uh, he was a medical doctor uh, who found Mjolnir and, you know, basically he, he becomes a, 
a channel for Thor on Earth. But, you know, Thor can't help them, but perhaps Dr. Donald Blake can. But when he does that, the puppet master loses control over him because the puppet master has fashioned an image of Thor rather than Donald Blake. And he says it, it's as if Thor has ceased to exist, um, which I like. Yep. Well, then uh, the thing and Wondar uh, return to the Baxter building. They they find Dr. Donald Blake um, um, treating the, uh, the injuries of the other members of the Fantastic Four. Um, Dr. Blake sort of explains what's been going on. Uh, and and then. What's his face? Oh, oh then uh, Donald Blake turns himself back into Thor to go after the puppet master. Um, the puppet master is happy that he can now control Thor again. But Radion, the atomic man, uh, demands that he give him the doll so he can control Thor. Right. Uh, it's my turn to play with the dollies. <laughs> So, yeah, so then we got, uh, of course, the big brawl between uh, the Thing and Thor. And, you know, they're kicking each other's ass. Um, but the Thing and, realizes that Thor is holding back. Exactly. Exactly. And then the Puppet Master and Radeon show up on the roof of the building, of the Baxter building. And uh, the Puppet Master pulls out a second toy uh, that he's fashioned of the Thing. Yeah, and also, like, to me, if you had the one of the thing, you could have just made him go after the other members of the Fantastic Four. You could have. Uh, but what you know what he doesn't have? He doesn't have figures of Namorita or her friend Anne or, of course, Wondar. Uh, and that's the cavalry. Uh, that's also because nobody would want a Wondar action figure. I would have bought the hell out of a Wondar action <laughs> figure when I was a kid. Remember the, the Mego superhero figure? Oh, yeah. Had I the Vosloff uniforms? I, I would have bought one of those. Yeah, you would have. You know, the thing is that I would always go to the store with my mom, and I'd always be sad that, you know, it was only the loser heroes that were left. You know, it was like the the you know the more popular hero figures wouldn't be there it would only be like the ones that people didn't like as much and i think there would have been shelves and shelves of wondar brian you wouldn't have had any problem finding uh a dozen wondar action figures at your local caldor i only ever i only ever had four i had uh i had batman i had conan uh i had and captain america and the falcon uh, i was never able to get the rest but yeah yeah i the one i had uh Captain America and the Falcon. I had Spider Man and Green Goblin, and Iron Man, and and the Human Torch. Uh, I think I had the Thing. And that's it. I've talked to my brother and see if he remembers if there were any others. So I had about half a dozen of them. Um, so anyway, I I want to touch on this because this is my favorite uh, moment of the issue. As I said, Wondar and and Namorita show up. Um, and here's what happens, folks. Despite Chris's derision, Wondar saves the day because he derives his power from the absorption of radioactivity. And Radion, the atomic man, is composed entirely of radioactive matter. Uh, so what does the mighty Radion do when Wondar shows up? He runs the fuck away. <laughs> yes, which is which is great on one hand, but on the other hand, what happens is that the two title characters in the story have nothing to do with the victory that then follows that. The victory is caused by Wondar, not even on purpose. It's complete happenstance that one of Wondar's abilities is that he absorbs radiation. So he arrives and he starts to, like deus ex machina, he starts absorbing radiation and Radeon runs away causing the puppet master to lose control of Thor and the thing uh, and, and bringing about his own defeat. Um, I hate endings like that, Brian. If oh, I were your editor, and you turn... you're glossing over the best part. It's not the thing or Thor that punches puppet master. <laughs> it's Wondar. He says, <laughs> you hurt my Uncle Benji. <laughs> this is not good. That's not a good ending. <laughs> If I were the editor, I would have turned it back to the author and said, fix this, you know, at least 
at least have the thing realize that Wondar has that ability and, you know, send Thor back to get Wondar or something. You know, I, I, I you know, anyway, it's fine, uh, you know, but uh, suffice to say, uh, you know, there are times that I don't mind Wondar, but in this issue, it was just too convenient for me. <laughs> and irritating. I, I hope there are no more puppet shows in this story. Well, there are. Uh, uh, but next week there is the Black Widow. Which I'm very excited about. I am as well. I am as well. Uh, uh, have you seen the film yet? Not yet. Um, I'm not yet ready to go back to the theater. I'm going to save that for uh, the Many Saints of Newark, the weekend that it is released. Yeah. Um, and I'm just, I'm not paying that much to stream a movie on TV, so I'll wait. Fair enough. Uh, okay. I loved it. My, uh, Lily and I loved it. Um, and Yelena Belova is going to be a major addition. Uh, Florence now, I've, great. I've got a question for you. Um, yeah. and I, folks, I suppose this may involve slight spoilers for Black Widow. Um, as we know from when we covered defenders on this show i'm a a big fan of red guardian uh the yeah. defender and as far as marvel villains go i've always had a soft spot for taskmaster taskmaster um now i knew that they had gender swapped red guardian uh you know she's a, a female of course in in the the bronze age marvel um played by uh david harbour from stranger things in the movie but i heard I don't know if this was just, you know, comics gate morons getting mouthy on on Twitter this or is major spoiler territory. So did, did they uh, did they also s switch uh, Taskmaster? OK, so for anybody who hasn't seen the movie and doesn't want to be spoiled, I would say Excelsior 2 right now and you should turn it off. See you next week, folks. Buy Matt Willison's books. <laughs> <laughs> but but if you have seen the movie already and you want to uh, listen in. Yes. Yeah, so basically, first of all. You may recall that Red Guardian, the female Red Guardian, was actually the second Red Guardian. Exactly. The, the but first, that, that to me is the iconic Red Guardian. Right. But the first one is the male Red Guardian. Right. Um, and, uh, and David Harbour uh, is really funny uh, and heartwarming as the, red, the, the, the washed up Red Guardian. Okay. Uh, who is constantly talking about the time he kicked Captain America's ass. <laughs> Although um, it's pointed out to him by uh, someone else who's in prison with him at the beginning of the film or near the beginning of the film uh, that Captain America wasn't he was still frozen in, in ice at the time that Red Guardian is claiming to have beaten him up. Um, <laughs> so that that in itself is fun. Um, I have never been a fan of Taskmaster. Right. I'm aware because there are fans of, of Taskmaster, the way that he's been portrayed in the last like five or six years. There have been a few miniseries, and apparently that has delved into his character a little bit more and made him a more interesting character. But prior to that, I always felt Taskmaster was just a gimmick villain. He didn't have like, you know, it's like, well, I can mirror anybody's fighting style. And there wasn't really much character there. It was right. just... And it was more of an idea than a character. So I actually really like what they did with Taskmaster in this one. Uh, the character is gender swapped. Um, See, that's but, interesting. Yeah. But well, and it's a big reveal in the movie. All right. Well, don't spoil it for me then. Yeah. But yeah. I, I, I just I had heard that and I thought, well, huh. That could be interesting if they do it right. So yeah. but, but it ties into the, the plot. And it ties into the plot. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. And and so so that's so yeah, it's it's a very interesting, you know, I I thought the movie was great. Um and again, I mean, uh whatever they call Yelena now, if Black Widow, White Widow, whatever they end up calling her as a character or maybe they'll just call her Yelena, who knows, but Florence Pugh is great and funny and charming and a better actress by far than Scarlett Johansson, who I've always liked, but Florence Pugh is just better. Yeah. Cool. I can't wait to see it. So when, when it's available to regular streamers. <laughs> well, 
I look at it this way. <clears throat> I mean, if you don't want to go to the movie theater, I mean, if you went to the movie theater and you and Mary saw it, you would spend at least as much money as the twenty nine ninety nine or whatever it is that they're charging you to watch it premier access. Nope, we wouldn't. Okay. Uh, the, the manager of, of our local Cineplex is a big fan of us both, so we get in for free. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. Well, you probably just get that manager fired. But, um, well, then, you know, maybe maybe that manager would run a midnight show for you. Well, I no, I've kind of got it in my head now. You know what a, a huge fan of The Sopranos I am. It, it's my favorite form of media ever. Right. Um so I, I, I have told myself that is when I'm going back to the theater. I'm waiting for the many saints in Newark. If I'm, if I'm going to go back to the theater and have the theatrical experience, I want it to be an important film for me, not just, you know, yeah, let, let's go see whatever the rock has out this week or, yeah, you know, what, yeah. whatever Vin Diesel has out this week. Um, so I, the, the weekend, uh, that the Sopranos prequel comes out, that's that's the weekend I go back to the theater. Well, that is a great trailer, I, I admit. Yep. Oh, it it yeah, it it, it gave me goosebumps. So yeah. <laughs> oh, is that what you call that? <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> that's what I call it. <laughs> All right, oh, brother. Look, I've got a goosebump in my pants. <laughs> I just that's you know. Um all right, well listen. To those who've hung on, Excelsior, True Believers, uh, by Matt Wilderson's books. Yes. We'll be back with issue 10 of both Marvel 2 and 1 and Marvel Team Up next week. See you next week, folks. Defenders Dialogue. You can listen to this episode and all previous episodes for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play Music, and wherever else podcasts are available. Defenders Dialogue is written and produced by Brian Keene and Christopher Golden. Our theme music is by Xander Harris. Our engineer is Matt Wilderson. Check out his books on Amazon.com. <laughs>